Uh, hello everyone, welcome to this episode of, special episode of WHF Talks Live. I am with Fatima Gailani, who is the member of Afghan Peace Negotiations and one of the esteemed advisory board members of the World Humanitarian Forum. Uh, prior to that, she was the head of GCC cluster at IFRC. Uh, Fatima is a very special person to me uh, personally. She is a role model, inspiration and a mentor. Uh, hope you enjoyed this conversation. I I'm quite sure, but um, I would like to pass my best uh, wishes. Uh, welcome, Fatiha. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. It, it is, it's my pleasure, as always. And you always boost my morale, so <laughs> you can... <laughs> Thank you. You're always Thank kind you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start with my first question. The... Um, purpose of this interview is International Women's Day. So I would like to start with your message uh, for International Women's Day. Well, I mean, I have always long messages because in where I come from, we don't have one problem. We have series of problems. And of course, uh, this year COVID is one of those. And my hope is that uh, countries like Afghanistan will get their share of vaccination because um, people are all, because of the war, most people are gathering in the cities. When you, uh, you're concentrated in cities, possibility of uh, getting sick is very high. And as you know, that because of the lack of facility, um, people will lose their lives. So um, my urge is that uh, we, we should have um, the vaccinations. Uh, the world will help us to have uh, vaccinations as soon as possible in countries like Afghanistan. Thank you so much. Speaking about Afghanistan, um, as I just mentioned, you are a member of Afghan uh, peace negotiations at the moment. Um, I'm certain that you've seen vast changes in the conditions of women and girls in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, Afghanistan is currently in a time of massive change. How have you seen women's uh, rights evolve over time? Well, um, for the last, um, well, I'll start by saying that uh, women's uh, changes for women started uh, in Afghanistan exactly 100 years ago when King Yaman Allah sent um, girls for a further education actually to Turkey. Um, it was exactly 100 years ago. It was um, 1921. So those girls came back with higher education and they really started um, a natural way of uh, bringing change for women. Um, I was only eight that we, I saw the first a member in the parliament was elected in, not in a quota system, but in an open, um, uh, I mean, competition. And I was, again, in the same year, um, I saw um, women uh, being in the cabinet, and for me, I, I didn't know exactly how important it is, but seeing my mother and those at the women at that age, I could see that this is really, really something important. Uh, so it started that, but the plague of war brought everything reverse, everything. Um, even our traditional way of respect for women and this um, hierarchy of women in traditional uh, lifestyle, even that was interrupted because of the uh, exodus of the refugees getting out of the country and also um, because of the war. Then uh, nearly 20 years ago, we were given another chance, uh, a chance uh, which gave us a, a very good constitution that in that constitution, men and women had equal right and um, the system of quota came in the uh, parliament that, um, and apart from th that quota, lots of women um, could win seats uh, in the parliament on their own. So uh, we were um, more than 27% um, of the, the parliament became women. Uh, and the same thing, uh, women ministers, women go governors and all that. I mean, the first woman governor happens to be uh, Habiba Dr. Habiba Sarabi happens to be my colleague here um, in the negotiations. So I believe, I strongly believe that never in the history of Afghanistan, we had so many educated and 
determined and capable women. So it will be very difficult and they should not lose this ground. Now we are in negotiations. Hopefully we will achieve peace. But this peace should not be at the expense of, of women and what they have achieved. Most peace talks, uh, they have very few um, women negotiators. They are mostly men. Here we have four women. And how we accommodate the rest of women in Afghanistan. Thanks to technology, like today we are together, we are constantly in touch with different parts of Afghanistan, with the civil society, with women's network, and with youth. And we take their recommendation and we take it very seriously and bring it to the negotiation table. So we don't want to be uh, dominating uh, the women's affair. Um, yes, we have two responsibilities. It is women's future in Afghanistan, as well as every aspect of the future in Afghanistan, whether it is politics, whether it is economics, whether it is agriculture, everything, we want to be part of it and we want to have our say uh, in it. Thank you. Uh, we have been discussing change for a long time now. And uh, before COVID, we were discussing it. During the pandemic, uh, we are discussing it. And in future, we are going to discuss change. Um, does post-COVID world, um, as we name it, global, the global reset, uh, provide an opportunity? Um, what ways can we aim to build back better post-COVID in support of gender issues? Uh, as sad as COVID was, as interrupted our life very badly, um, our economy, um, we lost loved ones. I personally lost my sister-in-law, my husband's sister. Um, many people that I knew and they were dear to me, we lost those people. Um, I, I, I'm still alive, but I, I had a very long and, uh, and bad one. But we had time to reflect, to reflect that we live in a, in a village, in a huge village that one mistake, one mistake could take us all and uh, we are all involved in it, we, we become victims. So that's why we have to learn how to help each other, how to really uh, complement each other, uh, not just for COVID, but I'm sure that we will have in the future good things and bad things, and it should be shared. We have to fix it together and we have to help each other. So um, nothing like that should be allowed to happen again. And I think that the post COVID um, world uh, should be a world with positive steps and a world that we have learned. Um, not um, do well and only, only talk the problems we have, but mostly on what we really learn. Um, condolences about the lost ones. Uh, we were in contact. I know um, you uh, personally suffered and um, unfortunately lost loved ones. Um, it, it, it has great impact, I think, on everyone's life. But um, while this was happening, I agree that we have to take this as an opportunity, really, to build back for a brighter future. And speaking of COVID, um, it has brought uh, lots of inequalities to surface and caused many at the same time around the world, uh, again, especially uh, around gender issue. Uh, do you have any examples uh, of inequalities that you have seen or experienced recently? Well, um, because uh, since COVID started, the peace talk started also. So I was really concentrating in this. I'm not saying that I took it lightly, but always there is a gender problem. Always in countries like ours, women will be in the back seat and the decisions um, which is made for them uh, make their life very difficult. Sometimes it is protection, but overprotection could also choke. In our country or countries like mine, sometimes in the name of protection, 
lots of subjugation happens on, on women. So we have to learn that also, that um, when it comes to gender, the equality of gender is as important as world complementing each other. If gender cannot complement each other, I assure you that we cannot get out of our own family and be able to fix the world. This is what I strongly believe, whether it is education, whether it's health, whether it is political participation, it has to be together and it has to be equal. Uh, women empowerment is another phase of uh, really gender equality or inequality. This is kind of the way that we will be able to sort it. Um, how can we empower women to navigate um, existing large organizations, uh, particularly those facing invisible forms of systematic discrimination? Um, you were, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the head of GCC cluster of IFRC and the Eastern regions are male dominant mainly. So I wanted to address this question to you. This is the truth, uh, but it is changing. I saw here in Qatar, I was amazed by these fantastically educated women. So the key is education. So when you are educated, you gain uh, trust and you gain respect of your own people. The same people that it was very difficult to pass through them for your education. But if for some miracle reason, miraculous reason you go and, and pass them and get to have a higher education, if you're lucky that you have a family who believes in higher education. So it is, then you are different, then you can achieve. Here, I met the Deputy Foreign Minister, um, Dr. Al Khater, Lulu Al Khater. I mean, it is delightful to see this educated young woman um, being in power and, and help other women uh, to get this uh, power. So yes, of course, education is the key. But now there are lots of women uh, that maybe for their uh, educating them is late. Are we going to leave them behind? Absolutely not. So that will have to come with, um, uh, with financial empowerment. Education and being independent uh, financially gives you respect in society. So we have to concentrate on that. And we have to build this to open ways for, uh, for ad other women. In Afghanistan, in spite of poverty, in spite of all the problems we have, we did achieve some of this. I'm not saying that in the villages, but in the cities. But because of the war, the concentration of people are in the cities. So millions and millions of brilliant young women capable, we, shall, we have to put them in use. So they should be a part of uh, building the future uh, for Afghanistan. And the same way in many other countries. Uh, one aspect of women empowerment uh, that needs to be further discussed is the role of men, especially within traditional family structures. Speaking to men about why women's education is important is often, as you mentioned, the first step towards getting more acceptance around women and girls' empowerment. What would be your comments uh, on this matter? For me, it is not just a surprise, it is an utter shock that one person in the Muslim world is uneducated. When the first order of God, before prayers, before fasting, before uh, Hajj or all this, was Iqra, read and learn, Ilm Qalam. Why we took it so lightly? Wasn't it very clear? Why would God, in our opinion, in our belief, um, spoke to our prophet about the importance of education, the importance of reading and writing. What right do we have to neglect it? So for me, this is a huge uh, shock. So in my experience, women who have achieved, they had fathers and brothers who believed in this. 
fathers and brothers who fought the wrong tradition with this word which came from God and gave this opportunity to, um, to, to educate their daughters and allow them to be somebody. So I strongly believe that when it comes to education, we must educate from the mosques, from television, from social media, that what a negligence had happened from their behalf, that they have to correct it. Uh, we uh, refer to the global reset dialogue um, and um, it brings new definitions of terms such as uh, humanitarianism and inequalities. What will be your definition of inequality as of today? For me, it has always been from the day I put my foot uh, in the Red Crescent. Yes, I was a volunteer from the age of 13 in the Red Crescent, but I was too, uh, too young to understand the core of the, um, the job of humanitarian job that we do. But when I got involved, when I got involved to learn that if I want to be effective, if I want to be, uh, be a person who could bring change and take that award from you for change makers, I really have to, uh, have to believe in it and I have to act on it. The being a neutral, when you are in humanitarian work, if you take political side, if you take linguistic side, if you take religious side, you're doomed. You can never succeed. So it is extremely important that a humanitarian work comes with total impartiality and independence. So that's why I was able to cater for uh, in the Red Crescent for my being a very good auxiliary to my own government, but as well as looking after those people who were hurt in the Taliban side. And I, got, I, I was able to gain uh, the respect from both sides because they saw that I worked with neutrality. So when it take, it, you take this globally, when it comes to the humanitarian work, just give to those with needs. Don't look who's taking it. Don't look which country it goes to. Just look at a human being which needs your help. Then you will succeed. Then you will change the world. Uh, you referenced to uh, your background and I would like to ask um, your personal experiences about gender equality. Uh, what personal choices or even sacrifices uh, we can call have you had to make uh, to be recognized as a leader uh, that you feel a man wouldn't have to uh, have had to make um, or who or what encouraged, influenced you, helped you to make those decisions or discouraged you or held you back? Again, it was a man. It was my father. I remember the day very well that I was about to start. Um, we were exiled in Afghanistan. It was a communist coup. We had to run away. And uh, I was living, just started living in London. And I wanted to, uh, to do my PhD and um, to be Dr. Fatma Gailani that I still I am not. Uh, so my father happened to be on a trip uh, to London and uh, he was, he was, he was, uh, he was a very kind person, but that day he was a little bit more kinder than usual. So I knew that there was something he wants to tell me. So I said, what is it? He said that, it is important for you to have a PhD. I said, of course, it's important for me. I had my MA and it is natural. I want to have a, a PhD. And I didn't think that I would be accepted in, in Cambridge to do that. See that it is important for me too as your father. But I'm telling you something more important is happening. At that time, I wondered what could be more important than my PhD. He said that the jihad had started in Afghanistan. And unfortunately, this jihad is very male dominated. I have to keep the door open for women. And I have to do it with my own daughter because I can't do it with someone else's daughter. It is not fair and it will not work. So I ask you to come and join the political side of the jihad. And only with you, I could, could open 
and keep that door open. This was the wisest thing that he told me. And I'm so happy that I didn't challenge it because what I am today was because of the decision I made that day. Yes, it was a sacrifice. I'm not Dr. Fatma Gailani. I'm just very ordinary Fatma Gailani. But it opened door for many other women. I became the spokesperson for the resistance. And today that I am in such an, I mean, such an honor to be one of the four women in the peace talks is because of that decision I made. If I could work as the president of the Afghan Red Crescent Society so successfully, is because of that recognition that I had that day. So, and working hard, it is not just in Afghanistan or countries like Afghanistan. Everywhere, a woman has to do the double of a man. Just to prove, you have to be best among your equals to get that place that, which is not reserved for women really necessarily. <laughs> so I'm not an exception. Uh, so I was one of those. Uh, you are maybe not an exception, but you are exceptional, and uh, <laughs> you are you you are making a history there. Um, but I, I'm really proud uh, and honored to know you. Um, and uh, as as I said at the very beginning, you are a role model um, to everyone that I know, uh, and um, they the ones they know you, they all think the same way. Uh, there is no exception in that as well. Um, Speaking of being a role model, uh, what would your message be to your younger self and to the young woman of today? Well, it happened actually last week, exactly where I'm sitting and exactly looking in the same camera that I'm looking now. There was a training going on uh, with, I mean, exceptional young men and women who are highly educated, who have very good jobs, but they took time to go and study how to help us, the negotiators, inside Afghanistan, so people will understand that the peace negotiation is not a piece of cake. You have to work hard, and yes, the time comes that there will be a give and take. So when I was talking to those young individuals, as if I'm seeing myself at their age and I'm talking to myself at that age. I told them that how difficult it will be, but how worthy that would be. And they have already started it. They could just go and have their job, well-paid job and be happy, but they were not that. They came out to give help to a very important Um, historical thing which is happening here right in Doha, which is peace talks. So I'm telling them that don't be afraid. Don't let people, if they judge you, just brush it and go forward and do exactly what you think is right. Learn from the past, but open the door for the future. This is the most important thing. Thank you so much, Fatima. You, I know you have a very busy schedule over there and I really don't want to make you uh, way too tired than you are. Uh, so I would like to get your final message, uh, closing remarks for today. Yet, my message is always the same, that let's not forget each other. Once the world forgot Afghanistan and look what happened. It was not contained only in Afghanistan. People in New York in their high rises died. Innocent people who were just going to the office died. People in the undergrounds of London died. People in the streets of one city or the other city died. We cannot ignore each other. This is a family. This world is a family. I'm a Muslim. I believe that we have one father, Adam, and we are children of Adam and Hawa, Eve. We are related. We must stay 
connected, we must help each other. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for being part of this special episode of WHF Talks Live. And it was such a pleasure to have you here today. Many thanks for your time Thank once you. again. Thank you. It was good seeing you. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs>